Also, as in the coming rapture, Elijah left no corpse behind. Fifty students from the local prophet's seminary searched for his body for three days and found nothing. We need to be realistic here. If one man's departure almost 3,000 years ago caused that kind of interest, the sudden disappearance of millions of people from the face of the earth will not go unnoticed. But the event will be met with, shall we say, mixed reviews. Throughout much of the world, small pockets of Christians, two here, three there, a whole family at home, a few friends out sharing a pizza, will go missing. The following scenarios describe the kind of things I imagine the rapture will leave in its wake. I have no knowledge of how many will be taken or how many will be left. Therefore, my statistics here are strictly guesses for the purpose of illustration, given so that you might appreciate what it might be like to be left behind. The time of day in any given location is strictly my conjecture. What does seem certain, however, is that the rapture will occur in real time at the same moment all over the globe, sometime during the 24-hour duration of the Feast of Trumpets, Jerusalem time. An Australian surfer, catching some late afternoon waves with a friend after work, sees his mate's board float into shore without him. The first thing that goes through his mind is, Shark! But there's no body, no blood. He hears yelling down the beach. Others are missing, too. A husband in India, sharing a meal with his family, looks up from his food to find his wife and young son gone. His frantic search reveals that 16 others in his village, including that missionary doctor and his family, are gone as well. No Hindus are missing, but, unfortunately, he reflects, none of the village's Muslims are either. Only the Christians. I warned her about talking to those people. Life in Mecca goes on as usual. No one is missing. Nothing is out of place. The Hajj pilgrims visiting the Kaaba catch the news in their hotel rooms on CNN or the local Al Jazeera affiliate and scratch their heads. Then someone fires a Kalashnikov into the air and yells, Allahu Akbar! A great victory is declared. The hated infidels, those despicable, lying, Jew-loving unbelievers are gone. Well, some of them, anyway. It will dawn on them slowly, if at all. Neither Allah nor his apostle Muhammad, peace be unto him, ever did a miracle of any kind before. Why did he wait fourteen centuries and then do this? Jerusalem dawns bright and clear, but it is soon discovered that 342 tourists, mostly from America and Canada, staying at five of the city's best hotels, have simply disappeared during the night. The Shin Bet swings into action, fearing the Palestinian Muslims, perhaps Hamas or Al-Qaeda, have gone and done something rash. The IDF is put on full alert, but the reports trickle in. It's not just tourists. Hundreds of Israelis have failed to show up for work. Interviews with their employers all tell the same story. These are good, responsible workers, not prone to wildcat strikes, even though many of them have occasionally expressed odd messianic theories. The black hats show up in droves at the Wailing Wall and immediately scour the nearby library for the proper prayer to recite, since you can't petition he whose name must not be spoken, Hashem, or the name for short, if a rabbi hasn't pre-approved your words. But there's nothing in all of Judaism to cover this. They finally select something about heroic warriors missing in battle, form minions, face the wall, and begin bobbing their heads. The Vatican is all abuzz. Scattered reports are coming in from all over Europe. Thousands of Catholics and even more Protestants are gone. No one knows how. Sometime before dawn, they simply disappeared. Among the lost are hundreds of priests, Dozens of bishops and even two cardinals. 
Scores of Europe's Protestant pastors are nowhere to be found. The clergy who are left talk in low whispers about those who were taken, their colleagues and friends. Invariably, these were the more radical of their number, daring to challenge the church on issues like the inerrancy of the papacy or the efficacy of the ecumenical movement, foolishly hindering their own careers in the process. Somebody mentions the rapture theory. He's laughed out of the room. A shaken pope prepares a statement, stressing hope and unity as hundreds of thousands of worried Romans crowd into St. Peter's Square. The Western Hemisphere is hardest hit, especially in the U.S. and Canada. The vice president and three members of the cabinet are missing. A third of the House of Representatives and 28% of the Senate seats are vacant. Thirteen state governors are gone. Local administrations find that so many people in positions of responsibility are absent, the day-to-day functions of local government, from trash pickup to emergency services to education, quickly begin to grind to a halt. Business is devastated. The heart of the American workforce, not those who have clawed their way to the boardroom, but those who faithfully serve in the mailroom, the factory floor, in kitchen and cubicle, are absent in the millions. Few companies are left whole. Many of the best companies, those still being run by founders who built their firm's strength through hard work and an attitude of service, are found leaderless. The damage is not spread evenly over the country. Some cities are left more or less intact. San Francisco and New York, percentage-wise, are relatively untouched. But rural America is in shambles. Whole communities in the South and Midwest are like ghost towns with half their populations AWOL. America's backbone is broken. Because the event happened in the daytime here, there is far more collateral damage than elsewhere. Thousands of traffic accidents occur simultaneously as cars and trucks being driven by Christians are suddenly left unmanned. Exacerbating the problem is the fact that emergency personnel, police, firefighters, EMTs, and hospital ER staffs have seen their own ranks thinned. Commercial aircraft manned by all Christian flight crews stay aloft, but only because their auto pilots keep them on course, landing hours later will prove to be their passenger's downfall. Life in the air traffic control towers becomes even more chaotic than usual, and not only because they're suddenly short-handed. Slowly, the infrastructure begins to break down because Christians are no longer there to do their jobs. Power grids fail, water and sewer systems malfunction, and half-staffed hospitals can't keep up with the carnage. Airports shut down. An instant gasoline shortage develops because the refiners aren't fully manned and fuel trucks can't get to their destinations. The supermarkets run out of food. The media, of course, doesn't miss a beat. They're on top of the biggest story since 9-11 with every resource they've got, which is almost as much as what they had before the event. Sure, a few low-level grunts are missing, graphic artists and sound techs and makeup people and the like, but the on-camera network stars are all ready to go. They quickly line up experts to hypothesize about what's happened. Law enforcement types, psychologists and parapsychologists, scientists and military leaders, politicians and, of course, clergy. The cops will only comment on what they're doing to contain and rectify the situation, meaning cleaning up the mess, not finding the missing millions. They're making lists, checking them twice, and trying to get hotlines set up for anyone with questions, or better, with answers. Likewise, the politicians offer condolences and hopeful promises of speedy resolution, assuring the public that the FBI, CIA, NSA, the Secret Service, and the whole Department of Homeland Security are on this thing like a duck on a June bug. Meanwhile, the Attorney General's office is exploring the constitutional ramifications of a special election. After all, the event has shifted the balance of power in both the House and Senate solidly toward the liberal side of the aisle. Something must be done. ACLU lawyers begin preparing class action lawsuits, blaming government agencies for being woefully unprepared for anything like this. 
TV psychologists and psychiatrists do their level best to make the remaining audience feel good about what's happened, whatever it is. They offer tips for dealing with stress and grief, confidently advising that the sooner the nation gets beyond this, the sooner we can begin to build a better world. Nobody overtly speaks ill of the dead or departed, but there is a subtle underlying tone of, what is it, relief? A newfound sense of liberation? Buried between the words in interview after interview is the unarticulated thought that those who are missing are the same ones who caused all the divisiveness in our world. They were the ones who wouldn't compromise, wouldn't accommodate, wouldn't make the first effort to get along with the peaceful religions of the world, wouldn't admit the obvious fact that there are many paths to God. The fundamentalist wackos are gone. We have a chance to start over, new and fresh. Are we not better off without them? CBS does a human interest piece on the black humor that invariably arises in times like this, especially in America. Within hours of the event, the sick jokes start circulating on the Internet. What do you call it when a hundred million Christians disappear into thin air? A good start! Have you heard about the new Christian diet? No, how much weight can you lose? All of it! For the first time in their lives, the parapsychologists find themselves getting respect, and not only because Halloween is just around the corner. Their theories actually sound sort of plausible in the wake of this horrible, wonderful event. Here at last is proof we are not alone in the universe. One of two things has happened, they announce. Either the aliens have come and selectively abducted all the intolerant troublemakers from the earth, or, more likely, the missing were actually aliens living among us, and they've gone back to their home planet. That buzzing sound some heard sounded like a horn, a trumpet of some sort, didn't it? That must have been the signal to return to the mother ship. Although he really hates it, the military spokesman finds himself agreeing with the parapsychologist. It has to be aliens, because nobody on Earth has the technology to do what's been done. We're the best there is, and we can't do it. As much as Al-Qaeda would like to claim credit for this, they have demonstrated that the apex of their achievement is simply blowing things up. And although they get lucky from time to time, they've never really been very good at that. It can't be the Chinese either, because they've lost a fair number of people themselves. The Russians? Same story. So, yes sir, it has to be an alien strike force, and we need to ready ourselves to repulse any further aggression. The Earth has a new enemy, an enemy from outside our world, and we all need to come together to fight it. World unity is what is needed now more than ever. Thank God for the United Nations! The scientific expert delivers a technical treatise on how making people disappear might be possible, something about string theory and warping the space-time continuum. It's not real, of course, just a concept some guys at Cambridge are fiddling around with. It uh, all happens in the sixth or seventh dimension anyway, not terribly practical. On the other hand, you could make people disappear today using the CIA's satellite-based laser weapons. I mean, we're not talking about teleporting them, you understand, just evaporating, disintegrating them. The audience feels strangely unsatisfied with his explanations. After half a century of believing that the scientist is God, they're now leaning toward the guy who thinks we've got little green men living among us. He makes for a more convincing soundbite. The network bigwigs figure that when things happen that offer no facile explanation, you've got to look at the religious angle. So the media lines up experts from every faith they can find. They want to get a Graham or Falwell type, but they can't seem to locate one. However, they get a Catholic archbishop, the minister of a huge church in New York, a veteran of the primetime news talk shows. She'll be perfect for this. A Muslim imam, a Jewish rabbi, a Hindu scholar, and they even hook up with the Dalai Lama via satellite. They all say pretty much the same thing. We've seen the hand of God here, as far as we can tell, and it's a sign, an omen. God is trying to tell us that we must achieve unity through tolerance for all religious beliefs. We must pray for understanding and enlightenment. 
After a diligent search, Fox News finds a defrocked television evangelist who'd once had a huge following, but had been caught with a prostitute and was subsequently convicted of altering the ministry's books. They sober him up long enough to tape an hour-long interview with a junior reporter, an attractive brunette. She is shocked to learn that he does not agree with the other esteemed men and women of the cloth, except for one thing— 